number seven of the second John. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is from the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now notice, it says many deceivers. Now notice what they deny. They don't confess. That word is homo again, which means to agree. They do not agree that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That means he came from heaven, in the flesh. That's the incarnation. And if they deny that, it says they're deceivers and they're antichrists. Well, of the churches in our country, of the mainline denominations, there are about 26 million of them, according to the present statistics. Of the so-called evangelical churches, about uh, 40 million. That's 66 million churches. Now, even the 40 million of the so-called evangelical churches, we're not sure what they believe on the, these areas of the Incarnation. We, we assume that they're all right. But the 26 million of the mainline denominations, most of them deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, from heaven, perfect God, taking it by himself, human flesh, according to the virgin birth. So there's many deceivers and antichrists in this world. Uh, his incarnation is denied, for example, in the Gnostic critical Greek text in 1 Timothy 3.16. We have in the King James Bible, we know that perhaps, great is the mystery of God in us. God is come in the flesh. He's manifest in the flesh. All right, now that, those verses right there, God is manifest in the flesh, is changed. God is taken out because the Gnostic, hypocritical, Gnostic, heretical uh, scriptures and uh, versions of the Bible do not believe that Christ has come in the flesh. God is manifest in the flesh. And so they're Antichrist. These versions that died, that by this definition, these verses, these Bible verses, the modern versions, all of them, uh, most of the, all of them, just one, bring one or two that don't take that verse and change it, and leave God out of that becoming flesh and manifest in the flesh. Uh, there are Antichrist versions, according to this verse, uh, the deny the Christ comes in. Antichrist and a deceiver. As far as deceivers, in Matthew 24, verse 4, the Lord Jesus warned his people and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many deceivers. And then in John 7, and verse 12, there was much murmuring among the people concerning the Lord Jesus. For some said he's a good man, others saith he deceiveth the people. Here they name the Lord Jesus as a deceiver. A division among them, and uh, the officer said, Never man spake like this man. And they answered the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? And so uh, this was a battle between even the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Nicodemus and other believers believed it, but other Pharisees denied is coming the first deceiver. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, it talks about the days that are upon us, present days. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, deceiving themselves and deceiving others. And then in Revelation 12 and verse 9, it talks about the devil, the great dragon was cast out. Notice the name for that dragon. The old serpent called the devil, and Satan deceiveth the whole world. And he's a great deceiver. And those churches that are not Bible-believing churches are deceived. They're Antichrist churches all over the world and deceived by the devil himself. In Revelation 20, and verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. The deceiver is then again named the devil. He's a deceiver. Now, deception is very clever, as you know. It doesn't come right out and say something, but just cleverly Half-truth, maybe, but it's a deception. And then, uh, it's also this, these people that deny the Christ has come, the Christ says, Antichrist. In 1 John 2, and verse 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He's an Antichrist that denieth the Father and Son. Antichrist we have all around us. And then 1 John 4, 3, John the Apostle repeats uh, in 1 John what he said in 2 John in the verse before us. In 1 John 4, verse 3, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. Again, he repeats it, 1 John and 2 John, for if you heard that it should come, and already is in the world. And so we have a problem. Those deceivers and those planos, misleading, leading people into error, and all these modernist apostate churches do that, and uh, we, they deny the presence 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect God and perfect man, and the virgin birth. Let's read verse number 8 together. <clears throat> Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. This look, Lepo, is to discern, look carefully at yourselves. Everyone in this room, everyone that's listening to me should look to ourselves. That's what this says. That we lose not those things which we have wrought. Now, I'm speaking to believers, to Christian believers. Things that we have wrought, things that we have worked for. Those who are genuinely saved. Now, we're not saved by our works. That's very clear, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But after we are saved, we are as workmanship created under, in Christ Jesus unto good works. <clears throat> God has before day that we should walk in them. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> these works that we, we do as believers, we've got to be looking out for them that we lose not our full reward. Because of the judgment seat of Christ, every genuine believer is going to be judged according to what we've done with our Savior. What we've done after we're saved. And uh, we've got to be very careful. We don't want to lose that reward. And looking to ourselves in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, Paul says to the church at Corinth, let a man examine himself. Examine. Every one of us in this room, everyone listening, should examine ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, he repeats this. He says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Everyone in the room, everyone listening by the means. So examine, are you sure you're in the faith and are genuinely saved? Examine yourselves. If you're not in the faith, get that way. Very serious. Uh, know not yourselves that how the Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. If we do not believe the genuine faith in Christ, have that for our, our personal faith, God calls us reprobates. Not just people who say, oh, I'm a Christian. What kind of Christian are you? You've got to be a Bible type of Christian in order to be saved, that we lose not our full reward. Now, believers, in Psalm 19, verse 9, now David said, The fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Believers that keep the words of God, there's reward. We don't want to lose that reward. In Matthew 5, 11, Lord Jesus said, Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you, persecute you, so all manner of evil against you falsely, for my name's sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. They have persecuted the prophets before you. The reward in heaven. We've got to put our eyes on that reward. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10, 10 to 15. It's a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. We've mentioned it many times before. Paul says, I'm the master builder, I've laid a foundation. And let another man build thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. What is the foundation? He mentions it. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. Now, if any man build upon that foundation, the works that we were as believers, we build upon that foundation three things that are valuable. Gold, silver, and precious stones. They're very small, though. They're valuable. We build on that. That's great. The other things are wood, hay, and stubble. That's great. We've seen them in. Every man's work shall be made manifest. These are believers now. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort. It is not how much it is, not how big it is. What kind is it? Is it gold, silver, precious stones, which will be purified by fire? Or is it big stuff, hay, wood, and stubble, which will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ? Now it says, if any man's work abide. And the only three things that will abide in those that list is gold, silver, and precious stone. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. We have a reward promised by the Lord. Now, if any man's works will be burned, hay, wood, and stubble type works save people. That's what our lives are built upon. He shall suffer a loss, great loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He won't be lost, can't lose your salvation, but all your works will be done and burned up. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, the Lord Jesus says, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. So we have rewards. And Paul, or John says here, look to yourselves that you lose not 
your full reward. Let's read verse number 9 together. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Abiding the doctrine of Christ. Uh, that word doctrine of Christ is used many times in the New Testament. Later on we're going to give some specific doctrines. But in Matthew 7 verse 28, uh, the people were astonished at his doctrine, the Lord Jesus' doctrine. The doctrine, the teaching that he taught. In Matthew 22, 33, that when the multitude heard this, again they were astonished at his doctrine. The doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he taught them. In John 7, 16, Jesus said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. We've got to know the doctrine, the scripture, study the words of God. And then Acts 2 and verse 42, the apostles, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. The apostles' doctrine was followed. Many churches today don't follow the apostles' doctrine. Don't follow the scriptural doctrine, the teachings of our Savior. In Acts 5, 28, <clears throat> uh, the Pharisees told the apostles, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And tend to bring this man's blood upon us. They preach the word no matter what the threats. That's what we must do as well. Preach the word regardless of threats. In Romans 16, 17, Paul said to the church at Rome, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division. In other words, expose them. Name names of the heretics around you in Rome. Mark them. Put an X on them. They cause divisions and offenses Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Stay away from them. Separate from them. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, we know this one. Let's say that one. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. <laughs> the doctrine, profitable for doctrine, the scripture. In 2 Timothy 4, Two to four. We say this every Sunday. And we know it. Preach the word. The instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach doctrine. One of the men sent me a paper this last week. And in that paper he quoted from his, his father, preacher. He said there are three things that are important that every preacher must preach. The first one is doctrine. The second one is doctrine. The third one is doctrine. But see, people today don't want doctrine. Why are you giving all this doctrine? Just tell a bit of stories. Make us happy and so on. Doctrine is important. And, and that's important. And then in 2 Timothy, preach the word in long-suffering and doctrine. And then in verse 3, uh, that same chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, the time will come, and it has come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after they, they but after their own lusts shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, be turned unto fables, from the story tales. This is a terrible thing. <laughs> the, this is a terrible thing indeed. Uh, in your bulletin today, I think we have these specific doctrines about Christ. Let's take a look at those. Notice those doctrines. Uh, before you. His deity, for example, coming by the virgin birth. That's the doctrine of Christ. Uh, many of these, these churches don't believe that. His miracles, his work on the cross for all sinners, not simply the elect. His salvation by faith in him alone. His becoming Lord and master of his of the life. His miracles, his purpose for coming into the world. That, again, the virgin birth came into the world to seek and save that which was lost. His bodily resurrection. His preparing a place in heaven for the saved ones. His second coming in rapture and return in glory. The judgment seat of Christ. His great white throne judgment. His 1,000 year millennial reign. These are some of the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now notice, let's read verse number 10 together. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. Come into your house. Well, if he's knocking on the door like the Jehovah's Witnesses, 
or it's a, it's a house church, you invite them in to speak. They don't bring these doctrines, the doctrines concerning Christ, and uh, don't receive them. And that word is in the present tense, prohibition. Stop receiving them into your house. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, they knock on my door, these Jehovah's Witnesses, and I come in. You're not going to convince them anything. If they don't bring the doctrines of Christ, they don't believe the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection, they're heretics in these things. Don't even open the door. Bye bye. That's what it said. Stop it. Apparently, people that John was writing to were receiving false heretical teachers into their homes. <clears throat> they're being led astray. You, who are an adult, if you're generally saved, you might be able to, to offstand and withstand their errors. What about the little children listening to all this nonsense? Other people in the house, stay out. Notice, stop receiving him. And then also, as a negative prohibition, neither bid him Godspeed. Stop bidding him Godspeed. It's a negative prohibition in the present tense. Stop bidding him Godspeed. Well, that Godspeed is a, a word that has to do with the word uh, may you do well, something up this. Uh, Keep on the right track. Let me see what that is. Uh, prevail, something like that. In other words, you don't bid them Godspeed. Don't say, do it well or you're doing fine. Just have them leave your house, but don't bid them Godspeed. Uh, this is very important. We've got to separate from apostasy. That's the title of our message this morning in Ephesians 5.11. It's a very important verse on separation. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't fellowship with them. But don't stop there. But rather reprove them. That word is a length of it. means to bring them to light. Shine the light on their evil deeds. Don't fellowship. Reprove them. That's why I've got to speak about them. A lot of people say, well, what are you being? I'm exposing the heretics. And why do you name the heretics? Because God told us to. God ordered us to. Don't fellowship, but rather reprove them and bring them to light. Expose their evils. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and following, Paul again says, Stop being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't get an unbelieving type of church. Stay out of it. The, for what fellowship? There are five different terms that God says to stay away from unbelievers. <clears throat> what fellowship? Number one, hath righteousness with unrighteousness. What communion? Second one, hath light with darkness. There's no communion there. What concord, that's the third word, hath Christ with Belial or the devil? The fourth word, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, an unbeliever? And number five, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And then in verse 17, wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And those people that are comfortable in apostate churches, to deny the doctrines of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and refuse to obey the command to come out from among them and be separate, they're going to have problems. Problems indeed. And uh, they're problems that they're disobedient to the words of God. And they should obey the Scripture. And we've got to obey the Scripture. Uh, all kinds of churches that people started out one way, they believe the Bible. And all of a sudden the preacher comes in and denies the Scriptures and the doctrines. And some of the people that were born in that church stay in the church. They don't leave it. If you can't drive out of the apostasy to start with and from the church, apostasy comes in. Uh, believers that are genuinely saved by genuine faith in Christ have no problem, no, no, uh, no support, no fellowship. There's nothing in common with the unsaved people. Certainly with preachers that are preaching the false doctrine, they should come out and be separate and touch not that unclean thing. Uh, let's read verse number 11 together. For he that biddeth him God's feet is partaker of his evil deeds. This is serious. It's cooperation. And uh, this is an important thing. God's feet, uh, it's the word Cairo. It's a present continuous tense. Uh, be well. He that says, go oh, be well. Wonderful, all you false teachers and heretics. Thrive. That's another meaning of this word. Thrive. Just grow and grow. See, If that's what we say, to those people that come to us with false doctrine, that not the doctrines of Christ, all these doctrines that we have in front of you, both the specific doctrines, like this, all this, <laughs> just touch the Bible, touch it again, just to identify. Anybody that doesn't bring these doctrines, 
uh, it's a terrible thing. And bring them Godspeed and thrive, if that's the case, are partakers of their evil deeds. We're co-conspirators with them. That's what it means. Now, anybody that kills and shoots and murders people, like people are murdering, they don't believe the Bible's thou shalt not kill all these ISIS people, all these Islamic people. Uh, they kill, 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 murder. That's against the Word of God. They don't care about it. But uh, those people that do all these evil things, uh, the person that drives the car for them to come to a place, whether in France or the United States, is a co-conspirator in the murders that are there. And many people have been put in jail because they're driving the car for the murders. And it says here, if we bid them thrive and do well, uh, partakers, co-conspirators in their evil deeds. As far as being partakers, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 22, talks about seeking out people for, for deacons in a church, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. Don't partake of other people's sins. As far as partake of their evil deeds, in Ezra 9 and verse 13, and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, Ezra knew that the Israelites had committed great serious evil deeds and God was punishing them for them. And partaker of their evil deeds if we say thrive and be well and God speed. As far as being evil and sinners, in first. Samuel 15, verse 13. The Lord said unto Saul, and the Lord said to Saul on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. God told them to destroy those sinners, yeah, the Amalekites. And Saul didn't do it. He left some to spare them, as we know. In Job 1, verse 1, here's a man who feared God and has chewed evil. That word is true. It means to separate from evil. And we must separate from evil. If we do not separate from evil, we will catch some of the evil deeds around us. We can't completely separate from evil. We've got to go to work. We've got to go to eat places and so on. There may be some evil people, unsafe people in the service. Uh, some of our police officers may be evil people. They protect us. But close fellowship with these evil people is going to rub off on us. If we have a close friend that's wicked and evil and swears and curses and carries on and talks filthy stories and everything else. Uh, some of that we may catch. That's why God says completely separate. And Job was the one that feared God and his truth separated himself from evil. In Psalm 1 and verse 1, we know this in perhaps. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, or sitteth in the seat of the scorpion. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. We've got to not stand, not sit uh, at all, or walk in the way of the ungodly. In Matthew 6, verse 13, Lord Jesus and his apostles, disciples' prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, one way to be delivered from evil is not to be associated with it. When you associate with it, it's just like sometimes tuberculosis. Uh, they're segregated in the hospitals. Uh, because it is easily caught. And uh, we visited uh, one of our friend's mother uh, just in the hospital a week ago, and we were told that uh, this is segregated. The woman had heart problems, but also uh, they had a sickness which was called what? I think? Flu. The flu. So before going in, they didn't want us to go in, well, all right, put a mask. So we put a mask. Now the daughter was there with a mask, and my wife and I put on a mask. I tell you, these things are contagious, many things. And if you hobnob, associate with closely with evil and evil people, you will catch some of that yourself. It will come upon you. Stay away from close associations with evil. Deliver us, Lord Jesus prayed that prayer, from evil. In John 17 and verse 15, it's prayer to the Father. High priestly prayer of our Savior to the Father. He said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, these believers. Don't remove them from the world. But that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Keep them from the evil. Stay away. And Romans 12 and verse 9. Paul says, Love, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Hate it. 
and cleave to that which is good. The only thing to do with evil is to hate it and despise it in our own lives, lives of our family, lives of our associates. Uh, a lot of people say, don't be so negative. Well, God is negative in many areas. This is one. Abhor that which is evil. And then in Romans 12, and verse 20, by the way, all eight of his Ten Commandments are negatives as well. Not, 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 not eight of them. God abhors that which is evil. Abhors evil. Then in the Romans 12, verse 9, abhor that which is evil. Then in Romans 12, verse 21, be not overcome of evil. That's a very important verse. Don't be overcome and completely conquered and have evil victorious in your life. But overcome evil with good. Don't be overcome and swallow it up. That's why we must abstain from evil practices and people that are evil in close associations. In Romans 13 verse 4 talks about God, the rulers are ministers of God to thee for good. Now, the ministers and leaders we have today are not biblical ministers and not biblical rulers. They're unbiblical rulers. Because many times the people that are rulers in this country and many other countries, when you do that which is good, you're penalized. Do that which is bad, you're rewarded. Uh, what is the definition here in Romans 12, uh, 13, verse 4? He's a minister of God to thee for good, but if I do that which is evil, be afraid, he beareth not the sword in vain, capital punishment. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. All governments are not that way, sad to say. But biblical government does that. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, be not deceived. We know this one. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Communications, that word means associations. Evil associations, close fellowship with evil people, wicked people, sinful people, corrupts, defiles good manners. And then uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22, Again, a negative, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, the thing may not be evil, but if, it's, if it looks like it's evil, thinks like it's evil, talks like it's evil, just abstain from it. Stay away from it, see? Uh, a lot of people, uh, they say, well, it's not outright evil, but there's an appearance. It's hard to stay away from appearances, but people look at appearances. They, they look at what we do, what we say, how it looks to them, that's the appearance. And if it appears evil, we should abstain from it. In 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 3, uh, it says, The Lord is faithful, speaking of believers now at Thessalonica, who shall establish you, give you a firm foundation, and keep you from evil. Keep us. We've got to be away and kept from evil lest it takes us over, and we become evil. In 2 Timothy 4, <coughs> verse 18, Paul's last letter was to 2 Timothy. Just about before they cut off his head, decapitated him and killed him. He says, Regardless what comes, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. He knew that death was coming. First Roman imprisonment, he got out of. Second Roman imprisonment, he did not get out of. He was executed by the Roman government for doing what? Just preaching Christ. No, no bad works, nothing. He said, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He did not refuse to die. He did not, was not afraid of death. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, so give me it that day, and not to me only, but all of them also, that love is appearing. So Paul was fearless, and the Lord would deliver him. In Hebrews 7, verse 26, the Lord Jesus is spoken here as our high priest. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Separate from sinners. The Pharisees said, why does he go among the publicans, these sinners. He went among them in order to, to seek and to say that which was lost and to tell them the truth of the gospel. But he was not a part of them. He was separate from sinners. And they could see this. The sinners, in fact, the sinners 
once they were converted, came to him. Uh, Zacchaeus, who was a little tiny man, a big crowd followed the Lord Jesus. He was so, so small, he climbed up on a tree to see the Lord. And Jesus looked at that man in the tree. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to be at your house today. He came down, and Zacchaeus was saved and converted and born again. So whatever I've stolen, I'm going to give, and more and more and more. Separate from sinners, and yet he came to seek and to save sinners, that which was lost. So separate from the sins of the sinners, but one to witness to the sinners that they come to Christ and be saved. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 11, But him as true evil, again, separate himself completely from evil, and do good, and seek peace, and ensue it. And so when this verse says, He that biddeth him Godspeed, he that biddeth say, Do well, partaker of his evil deeds. May that not be us. Partaker. That word coined on that word, made a partner, to enter into fellowship, to be an associate, to have oneself a share or partner in the evil deeds. Separate from evil, and don't have anything to do with it. Let's read verse number twelve together. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. <laughs> Apostle John wanted to meet with the people he's writing to in this local church. Many things to write. He just couldn't write, but he wants to come to them. I'm sure he did come to that local church. He wanted to speak face to face. There's something now, sometimes speaking face to face causes division. And argumentation and problems. Depends on <coughs> who the face is that you're speaking to, who your face is. But John said, no, I want to come face to face. And the purpose of it is not to have a big fight and argument, but that our joy may be full. Our joy. That means John's joy and the people's joy may be full. Fullness of joy. Now that word for full, that uh, word to plerao, it means to be complete, to fill to the top. You know, you have a cup of water, but sometimes it's about an eighth of an inch from the top. This fullness is filled right up to the top. It means so that nothing shall be wanting. Full measure, full to the brim. Fullness of joy. Now that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. The joy of God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells those who are genuinely saved. That's what he wants to produce in us fullness of joy. John, one of these people, is writing to to have that fullness. In Psalm 1611, In thy presence, says David, is fullness of joy. In heaven there will be fullness of joy in his presence. We should have his presence, fullness of joy, even while we're here. If we walk to, by him and to him and with him. In Psalm 51, verse 12, After David's heinous sin of murder and adultery, he prayed to the Lord, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's what we need, is the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then Jeremiah 15, verse 16. He was a battered prophet. People didn't like him because he preached the truth. He was put in prison in many places. And then uh, he was minded at one point uh, not to speak anymore. Because every time he spoke, that they put him in prison, they, they uh, hurt him. But then in Jeremiah 15, 16, we know this perhaps, Thy words were found, in, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. And he found the word of the Lord, the joy of his being, and the joy of his heart. And he began to preach in his feet. He could not, he could not hold his peace. Because the Word of God was impelling him to preach the truth that he knew about the Lord. And then in Habakkuk 3, verse 17, I like this very much. <laughs> Habakkuk the prophet in the Old Testament, he says, although, number of all those, number one, although the fig tree shall not blossom. That's the first thing, no blossom. Number two, neither shall fruit be in the vines. No vine fruit. Number three, and the labor of the olive shall fail. No olives. And the fields, the fourth thing, shall not yield any meat. Number five, the flock 
shall be cut off out of the fold. And number six, there shall be no herd in the stalls. The man will be penniless without these, these animals, these fruit trees. What's he going to do? Though all that be true, in verse 318 of Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let's say that again. I, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Now, that can be and should be and must be everyone who is genuinely saved and born again. Uh, because things don't always go like we want them to go. We have our ups and our downs. But we've got to be as Habakkuk and all these five disasters in his life. But yet the Lord caused him to rejoice in his salvation. And that's what our heart to be as well. He is much greater than all of our iniquities, all of our hardships, all of our difficulties. He's greater than all. And praise God that Habakkuk the prophet said, Yet, if all these things go against me, I will rejoice and joy in the God of my soul. Rejoice in the Lord. Then in Luke 2 and verse 10, the angel at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ said unto them, Fear not. We know this one. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful joy the Lord Jesus came to bring, the joy of the Lord. And it's his, his coming into the world, dying for the sins of the world, that we trust him and have his joy. And then in Luke 15 and verse 7, it talks about the prodigal son who is brought back to his father and brought back to the Lord, apparently. And it says, Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons that need no repentance. That prodigal son came home and the father rejoiced. And God rejoices when a sinner comes to the Lord Jesus and is saved. In Luke 15, verse 10, uh, we said that also, 15:7. But also 15.10, likewise I say, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Mm -hmm. Now, one sinner out of 99 is a small, tiny percentage, isn't it? Infinitesimal, tiny. Yet, God rejoices. You see, that's so true. When the Lord Jesus was here upon this earth, he was in a minority. Well, we had 12 apostles and different apostles, disciples that followed until we became crucified on the cross. And the 12, one forsook him already and hanged himself, Judas, and was a betrayer. And the other 10 or 11 that were there, but only one of the remaining 11, John, went to the cross and was there at, the, at Calvary. And, of course, all the disciples forsook him and fled at his cross at first and all the multitude that followed him on the day of his coming into Jerusalem Hosanna, he that cometh in the name of the Lord at Calvary, they just diminished and they were not and so the small tiny minority is there but that's what God says rejoice, one sinner he's happy, joy in heaven rather than all the nine ends say they don't need repentance Say that they're all right. Say that the works are going to get them to heaven. That's important indeed. Then in John 15, verse 11, the Lord Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. The Lord Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Remember that? Despising the shame, is sat down at the right hand of God. The joy set before him for the cross, bringing him joy, he saw beyond the cross. And those who come unto him and be saved in the genuine believers and be in the family, his own family. So he says these things that, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Not just half full, full, completely to the brim. In John 16, 22, ye now, ye, not, ye now therefore have sorrow. When the Lord Jesus told his apostles, I'm going to be leaving, uh, you're going to be without me, sorrow filled their heart. He said to them, And now therefore ye have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Your joy. No circumstances, no people can take away the joy of the Lord Jesus. In John 16, verse 24, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, told the disciples and apostles. 
ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Fullness of joy. God wants it. In Acts 13, verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Filled with joy. Uh, not sadness, regardless of circumstances. In Acts 20, verse 24. <clears throat> people were quite said to Paul, Now, Paul, it's revealed to me that you shouldn't go to Jerusalem because you're going to be killed. And Paul said this, None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. A course that the Lord Jesus laid out for him on the finish. That should be our goal as well. What does God want us to do? Finish that course. Don't give up. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was faithful. He went to Jerusalem. He was tried. He appealed to Caesar. He went to Rome. He was in prison. And came out of there. But he wanted to finish his course. And he witnessed in prison. And many were saved in the prison Roman jail. He finished his course. The Lord Jesus gave him a particular course to run. He hadn't finished it yet. He's given every one of you who are genuinely <coughs> saved, if you are genuinely saved, a particular course to run. Mm -hmm. It's not finished until you finish running that course. Mm -hmm. We're all different. God gives you different courses than maybe me, but every one of us has got something that he wants us to do and to finish with joy. Not with weeping and, and, and sorrow, but with joy. In Romans 15, verse 13, this is an interesting verse. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. The God of hope fill you with all joy. There's joy all over the scripture, is there not? And we know Galatians 5.22, we say that together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Love, joy, the fruit of the Spirit of God, if we're controlled by the Spirit of God, He gives us that joy. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, <clears throat> this is what we said earlier, we were to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He, with the joy set before Him, the joy of having believers come to Him and be saved. Not the cross, but the joy was there, and He he didn't care about the terrible, terrible, ignominious death that he died at Calvary. Joy was set before him. In 1 Peter 1, and verse 8, uh, we know this one perhaps, Whom having not seen, he loved. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, he rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Having seen him, but without seeing him, you see rejoice with joy unspeakable. Then in 1 John 1, and verse 4, These things write unto you, that your joy might be full. This is what God wants us to have. Fullness of joy. Let's read verse number 13 together. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Uh, greeting in Philippians 4 verse 21. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. Uh, we've got to greet and love the brethren. And greet thy friends by name. It ends, this second John ends with this word, uh, Amen. And it's interesting uh, that that word is a remarkable word. It was transliterated letter for letter from the Hebrew, Amen, which means may it be, or I believe, directly into the Greek, the New Testament. <coughs> then it's letter for letter into Latin. And then in English, many other languages, Amen. Uh, it's been called the best known word in human speech. The word is directly related, in fact, almost identical to the Hebrew word for belief, Amen, or faithful. Thus it came to mean sure, truly, an expression of absolute trust and confidence. When the Apostle John closed his second letter, she said, Amen. So be it. It's true. Believe all these things. This last part of Second John talks about separation from evil people and evil things. And if any man comes and brings out the doctrine of Christ, all the doctrines that we believe in, he says that they're deceivers, they're antichrists. And to use that term does not go with a lot of people. But that's what God uses. For those who deny that he's come in the flesh, how can you come in the flesh without being first in heaven to come? Come in the flesh. Perfect God, 
with the incarnation through the virgin birth, the miracle, in the flesh. If you deny that, that's, the, that's his deity, that's how he got his perfect deity, his perfect humanity, in the virgin birth at the, at the, at the birth of his Savior. And so to deny that, come in the flesh, he is not of God, he's a deceiver, he's an antichrist. And we've got to be very clear that if people come to our house or to our fellowship and settle down and don't bring this doctrine, we should not receive them in our houses. We should not bid them Godspeed, say, wonderful, what you're doing is great. And if we do bid them Godspeed, uh, we're partakers of their evil deeds. May God give us wisdom in all of this. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank Thee for this Second John, this little letter. We thank Thee for the Apostle that stood firm for the things of our Savior. We pray, Lord, that Thou mayest give every one of us who are genuinely saved eternal and full joy, right to the brim, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what our difficulties. If there be any in our service this morning that's not saved yet, never had genuinely accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, is still lost, may they come to thee, those listening by the means as well. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's turn again to our hymn books. Go to hymn number 474. Four hundred and seventy four. Constantly abiding. Let's say the verse together. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews thirteen five. Four seventy four.